Last month, we were able to frost seed some of the newly established seven acre meadow, which had formerly been the site of an old nursery. Though I wish we could snap our fingers TikTok style and show you the immediate results, I will be the first to admit getting to the stage of even casting some seed on the ground wasn't so straightforward. Fudge, didn't work. In order to show you more of what we mean, it's worth rewinding to take you back to the start when establishing a meadow in this area was just a seed of an idea. When we saw the land in June of 2020, it was largely barren, and they had just started to remove some of the hoop houses and nursery containers when we arrived. You're just overlooking what would be the, originally the nursery, but you have another pond right here that you're essentially overlooking, and you have the distant views and you have the forest in the back. Since we weren't going to be using that area as a nursery, our immediate idea for managing it was to turn it into a native meadow. This appealed to us for a number of reasons. Firstly, we wanted to turn what was once a conventional nursery to reliable habitat and food source for insects, birds, and wildlife. According to the Audubon Society, fewer than 40% of North America's historical grasslands remain. And though grasslands and prairies didn't seem to be extensive in New York, save for the Hempstead Plains on Long Island, they can serve as critical habitat for a diverse array of species, including a range of caterpillars and other insects, which make up a significant amount of many birds' diets. And meadow-dwelling species like killdeer, bobolinx, and orioles, for example. Secondly, we didn't want to do too much maintenance over time, especially over such a large area. Even though meadows take a lot more work up front, maintaining a meadow only requires mowing once a year. And if we were to let the area establish itself into a shrubby forest, it would eventually just block the distant views of the hills from the common house and the proposed communal homes. Grasslands also provide other benefits. They are reliable carbon sequesters because they store the carbon underground, and if we got rain like we did in 2021, which was a lot, then they can be integral in stabilizing soil, reducing erosion, and increasing water storage capacity in the landscape. On the flip side, however, most meadow species, such as many grasses and flowers like butterfly weed, lupine, and lanceleaf coreopsis, for example, can sustain themselves in really droughty, poor soil conditions, which is really the majority of the land. And lastly, meadows are just beautiful. Though maybe some of our neighbors wouldn't agree with us and think we're crazy, maybe, just maybe, we could bring folks around to the idea that native meadows can make beautiful, biologically diverse habitats that have value in their own right. By the time we closed on the land, which was a few months later after our first visit, much of that area had already started to fill in with plant life making the establishment of a native meadow seem to be that much more daunting. We are driving on the property for the first time in a long time. And it's fall this time. It's fall and it is the last walkthrough that we'll do before we actually transfer the funds to get the wow, property. Wow, look at all this growth. I know, that's why I was like, uh-oh, how are we gonna plant this meadow? <laughs> oh my God. So much growth. It's like it wasn't bare before, you know? As we walked around more, we saw a lot of non-native grasses and Canada goldenrod had taken over. And there seemed to be an endless stretch of invasive honeysuckle and multiflora rose, which both spread fairly aggressively and often shade out and inhibit other, less aggressive native species from establishing in and around them. That is one thing for sure. Like when these come out, there's so much more space. We began removing the honeysuckle and rose in the late fall, but within just a few weeks, we were under a couple feet of snow, which pretty much hindered all of our plans to remove any more invasives. What was good about the snow is that by the time spring rolled around four long months later, all the plants that were growing from the year before had been crushed, so it really gave us a sliver of opportunity to walk the area and take inventory of it. Keeping this area a meadow is our goal but we didn't really know how to go about it, largely because the area had been so altered. There was exposed tile drainage, acres of non-biodegradable geotextile material, metal pins and pipes, and four to eight inches of gravel on top. 
We started to ask around for advice and we got quite a few different opinions. Luckily, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or the NRCS, pointed us to Miguel, who installs pollinator meadows. He recommended removing the geotextile material and then disking in the gravel to prep for meadow planting. What we found out is that it was easier said than done. All right, so we have uh, Miguel with us and Miguel is gonna be helping on our meadow project. I think last time you were here, it was like really wet and rainy. We didn't really walk very much. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest concerns that we had there's like tile drainage, there's like metal pipes. We've had a number of people come on the property and I think everybody agreed that we should get the geotextile fabric out. I think it's a fair bet. It never really after a year or two in any landscape situation, I haven't really seen landscape fabric do much other than become kind of a plastic that you need to get out of your landscape. Yeah. And I would certainly think here we want to get it out just because it's gonna start uncovering itself more and more. And I think it'll pull out relatively easily. A lot of the pipe is at the surface. That's the, like landscape tile pipe. Yeah, and I think they never really put it deep in the ground. And so when we were talking about like tilling things under. Yeah, like, and it migrates up too. And they yeah. could have had this as like a drain in this house because it kind of is sloping to yeah. catch whatever and run it, who knows, maybe even off that corner and down. We do have this really amazing landscape. They did bring all this gravel in and they did put this tile drainage in and it does drain very well. Mm -hmm. And not, you know, for how much rain and how soggy it is up there. Can we somehow preserve that as much as possible? You might have know. some potential to have a unique ecosystem of plants growing here, you know, like a lot more stuff that doesn't need the amount of water, or prefers a dry climate, a lot mm -hmm. of sedums and stuff like that even, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be as big and lush, but I have a feeling that ultimately, you know, nothing is growing on it now, but as soon as you get stuff tapping through it and like the Canada goldenrod and stuff, yeah. I think that's gonna get into the dirt underneath this. Yeah. And it might end up kind of equalizing, but maybe not. Maybe it'll always be a little drier. And so there's several of these, I mean, that we saw. Uh huh, uh huh. And, and it's not, it's not Is it on to, do you care if I do that? No, no, go ahead. Is it on a plastic pipe underneath though? Maybe. Feels Might like be. it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So it's on a black plastic pipe. Usually they're not gonna run this kind of pipe everywhere. And if they do, I would pretty much be really surprised. This is part of what we found under the earth. Yeah. <laughs> and we already took a, a 14 cubic yard trailer load of trash out. This was out into the pond? Yeah. This was yeah. Into the pond. yeah, yeah. This was out of the pond. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the irrigation pump. And it was pumping water up here. So you could see this run here. It goes yeah, all the two inch. And then they had these smaller ones running off so the I two. I these pipes because I they look like they're in good condition. I'm not sure if they're worth keeping or... Yeah. I mean, they're, if you're not doing much irrigating, you probably won't have too much use for them. But yeah. at the same rate, I'm sure someone would want to take them off our hands. Yeah, you know, there's like the reuse center, yeah. those types of places. Yep. Well, I'm wondering how it's going to disc because rocks interfere. Not the little ones, but some of these other ones mm -hmm. tend to run it up onto that. And I don't know, even this, if it's going to have... I've never disked gravel, you know, so <laughs> I don't know exactly how that's gonna affect it. I don't think it's gonna negatively affect it too bad. Although it might not wanna cut in like it would normal soil. Right. I mean, this is this is our, um, this is a, a road essentially. So we'd right, keep it as a road. access line. Yeah, and I guess like we could, I guess we'd map out everything for you so it's like you like you know what to what to disc and what not to disc. We started to get a little worried because a couple folks who are familiar with the site told us that we can't just remove the geotextile. There were a lot of metal pins and pipes that could pop tractor tires, so we would need to basically excavate those out. We wanted to make Miguel fully aware of this, but after doing so, he wasn't sure he'd want to carry through with the project. We brought in a couple more folks to come weigh in, including Andy, who is a total hoot and was highlighted in an earlier video. 
He recommended that before anyone goes in there, that it would need to be excavated and graded. So that's exactly what we did. Brian, who happened to be the same guy that excavated us out in the winter, would help excavate out the old nursery and remove anything that could hinder running a tractor over the land, which was just about everything. All right, so Sondra and I feel pretty spent because we have spent the better part of the today actually going over this really overgrown field, removing some of the honeysuckle, the quaking aspen, the multiflora rose. I mean, it's it just got away from us. I mean, one minute it was stone and the next minute it was shoulder high grass. And we didn't realize it, but we had suggestions kind of at the last minute that we're going to have to grade this area so that in the future, if we want to maintain it as meadow, it'll be easier for a tractor or skid steer to come in because it's a little bit too bumpy and there's like landmines in here. So we have like a lot of metal irrigation pipes, things like that, that we want to, you know, tear up also landscape fabric and geotextile fabric. And um, there was like a row of arborvitae that was planted that looked a really, you know, not natural. So we ended up uh, removing most of the arborvitae and keeping one because all the rest of them were pretty heavily deer browse. So we thought, okay, well, we'll save one. It's about, we caught kind of the tree rings on the others. It's about 14 years old. And then we have all these quaking aspens. They look so beautiful. I know this will be an aspen field before we know it, but if we are to maintain this meadow, then we're going to have to mow it once a year at the very least. And what we realize is that we don't want this to go to a forest. We want this as meadow. So even if we planted it as meadow or let it just go natural into like goldenrod forest, all this you see here is goldenrod. So that's pretty much what it would be. Um, there's some other stuff in here like penstemon. You can see like the white flowers now, buttercups, things like that. But we'd rather actually do an enrichment planting of a native meadow because native meadow doesn't really exist very much anymore around here. So it'll be kind of interesting to see what species we bring back with that. But we have to grade it and we didn't know that. So we have a bulldozer way down there and we have a guy named Brian who's gonna come tomorrow and Friday to do it. So Sandra and I only had like basically two days to take out the rest of the honeysuckle. And I'll tell you, we didn't finish it off today. And uh, we have to spend the night actually burning a pile down there that had the multiflora rose. So, oh, there is no rest for the weary, for sure. We're pretty pooped, but that's the update on the meadow for now. So if you could tell by my puffy eyes, it's really early in the morning. It's um, about 5.30 a.m. We got up a little before uh, this time and uh, we thought, well, let's put in a couple hours before our guy comes on the bulldozer and um, bulldozes the meadow. So. We want to save some interesting plants in the meadow. Uh, there's some achillea, there's some penstemon, there's some really interesting uh, physocarpus, which is uh, nine bark. There's so much nine bark growing in there that we want to actually save some of them because I think as soon as we bulldoze the plants over, you know, they may or may not be there, who knows. We didn't finish last night. We just like ran out of time, we ran out of juice and um, this morning, Saunders is going to burn the few pieces of multiflora rose and the honeysuckle. I say a few, but there's a lot. It's, uh, it's gonna be a crazy morning because our guy Brian comes in at uh, 7.30 a.m. to actually do the work. So it doesn't leave us much time. Basically, a one-day job became a three-day job in mid-June and another week of just boots on the ground trash removal. So Brian is on the bulldozer and he is just going to get started on the meadow. So fingers crossed this works out and everything turns out all right. Look at all this junk coming out of the lane. This works really well. There's gonna be some pipes left in there, but what are you gonna do? I mean, I could probably cut them with the saws all just get as much out as I can, but try that out. So that's the geotextile material here. 
you could see it. And you could see that if uh, all this area that he had graded, and then he pulled the geotextile up, it created these big divots. So that's not good. Um, so we're just gonna take the geotextile material up first. I think there's a lot of infrastructure under the ground. And uh, it's gonna take a while for it to all come out. But if we don't do it now, Whenever we're going, are we going to do this? Once we plant a meadow here, it's too late. So we got to do this first. Um, but there's all kinds of surprises under the ground, like wires, PVC pipes. We shut all the powers off, the power off. So hopefully there's nothing on the ground that can zap us. But you never know. So we're just going to keep continuing to pull stuff out of the ground so that. Uh, you know, a wire might be a hazard to a mower because a wire gets stuck into the blade and then that breaks the mower. So we don't want wires. Then there's these thick ground rods but also not very good for a tractor or a mower. So we want to get those out. And as long as everything is kind of buried at least a foot underground, I don't think it will show to the surface anymore. So that's what we're aiming for. So I'm gonna do just a little recap here. Uh, Brian just left back to his place because he's gonna get the mini excavator because what we're finding is that we're pulling up this geotextile material, which is like four to eight inches down underneath all the gravel bits. And that is ruining the grade. So he's going and grading and flattening and smoothing out the land so that tractors and skid steers could come on to maintain the meadow afterwards. But, um, you know, he's finding the geotextile material rips up the land and makes it craggy again. So he's just going to get the mini excavator to pull out the geotextile first, and then we'll go and grade the land. After all that, we needed to find someone to do a round of disking, seeding, and cultipacking our seeds. The plan was to do three rounds of cover crops to prep the land for meadow seeding in the fall or winter. But with Miguel out of the picture now, we were pretty much high and dry without anyone to help. Brian later gave us a ring though and shared that a neighbor could help. And that's when Pat came to the rescue. He took on the job of clearing out whatever else was on the land with a brush hog then disked and then seeded our first round of buckwheat right before the end of June. Well, our neighbor Pat just randomly showed up. <laughs> he said he'd come before the week's end. And he's now starting to disk the meadow. And after he disks the meadow, which looks like it's actually coming along, even with all this gravel, uh, he's going to seed and healthy pack it. Right, so this is gravel only and then the disc does this to it, just yeah. mixes it up a little bit. Yeah, so it goes down probably three or four inches and just kind of gets the dirt up there and we don't know if it'll work throughout the whole thing because in some cases the gravel's like six to eight inches deep. So he'll see where it doesn't work and where it does work. And uh, yeah. The trouble is, is that we had to clean this up first. 
usually you're, you're just working with a field that's already clear, cleared out. You would just bush hog it and then do this process. You don't have to do three days of cleaning up <laughs> pipes yeah. and irrigation and textile and stuff like that. So mm. it's great. We were using these cover crops for a few different reasons. Firstly, they act as green manure, which is basically leaving the uprooted vegetation in the field to serve as a soil amendment and thin layer of mulch. Secondly, I describe planting the seeds as taking up the seats in a bus. So if all the space or all the seats on a bus are taken, then you're less likely to get any weed seeds. Thirdly, the buckwheat, when in flower, provides a nice source of pollination for insects and food for animals like deer. Then the last round is oats simply because they winter kill, which means that they don't survive over winter and can naturally just serve as a green manure and mulch. The buckwheat were literally disked in a month later and we went ahead and planted a second round of them. About 30 days after that, we did the exact same thing, disked in the second round of buckwheat and planted a round of winter kill oats. Though we put in an early order for seeds, it was hard to secure them, mainly because there was a seed shortage, but also because we were ordering some more obscure species. We placed emphasis on grasses and flowers that can feed insects, as 90% of our native insects are specialists that generally feed on a specific species or genus of plants. Both warm and cool season grasses would make up about 70% of the matrix, and the other 30% would be perennial wildflowers. So you wouldn't think it that it's going to freeze this week, but that's what the weather forecasts say. It's really beautiful and sunny today, but there's like three or four days of freezing temperatures, which means we're supposed to be planting our seeds in the meadow, <laughs> which is exciting, but we haven't received any seeds yet from Mike and American Meadows. So I've texted him, I've called, I've emailed, I've become that annoying person to be like, hey, where's our seeds? <laughs> Um, so hopefully it works out. It's okay if we seed a little later, but I'd rather seed it now while I'm here and not have to wait another few weeks. So we'll see. We only got about 30% of our seeds a month later than expected, but luckily we were having a mild enough winter to do some initial seeding. The color pattern that we're going for here is primarily like these purples, reddish purples, a little splotches of yellow and then very tiny splotches of red. So that's really the color pattern. And little tiny splotches of white here and there, but it's primarily purples. Purples and blues and blue reds. Whoa, what's that? This is little blue stem. We saw this at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. It has a really neat structure. It has like this bluish gray leaf and it gets this really tall purple inflorescence. Very nice. Very nice color pattern. These are all finished. So, blue grama grass is the main matrix grass down here, actually. So, you see this little green one in here. It's kind of like olive green. That's that. So we'll just go around the edge and spread that. Look, this is like fluffy. <laughs> this is like the rim. Yeah, what's the density for these? Like, I kind of want to lick my finger and stick it up in the air. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be different for each one because each seed is different size. Yeah. I kind of like I'm taking the the belief of like let nature take its course and wherever it seems to plant because every place where a seed lands is not necessarily going to guarantee that it germinates. Mm -hmm. Like as I'm doing this one may actually sit on top of a blade of grass and never hit the ground and then never germinate. See like this is a great example of a biennial. This thistle grows really low to the ground the first year. So this is a first year plant. Second year, it's gonna stick out a big flower spike. So some of our plants that we're planting are like that. So you're just, you're not really gonna see them until the second year. This is like our unintentional hugel mound. 
This is the graveyard for all the biggest stumps. Look at the Echinacea purpurea seeds. Hold on, I was gonna show some big stumps first. Oh. Look at that thing over there. Something's living in here though. Look at that. Yeah, this is where uh, all the plants that didn't make it in the nursery ended up. Yeah. The size of the mound, it was quite a sizable portion. What kind of seed you got there? Okay, that's, this is Echinacea purpurea. It's purple coneflower, a really good medicinal plant. I made sure I bought a lot of this one because I might be harvesting some of it as well for medicinal purposes. And it grows pretty tall, like four to five feet. So we like the idea that this is like our property boundary. So you could grow like higher plants outside on the outskirts and then, you know, lower, slightly lower plants on the inside. It's kind of like a big, a big, big privacy garden. privacy screen. Yeah, a big garden privacy screen. It's nice also to spread these out because you, you don't know whether they're gonna do well in a certain area. So when you spread them out across the whole meadow, you'll eventually see which ones really took to a certain area. It's tempting to wanna to use the whole bag, but this whole bag is supposed to be for the entire area. It's pretty incredible that such a small amount of stuff creates such a huge amount of stuff. Yeah. So I have two yellow spots, you see that? So that's where like a group of sunflowers are gonna go. Let me just make sure I have everything. So these are the three. Those are three different types? Or? Yeah, three different types of sunflowers. So I'll have the, there's a coneflower, gray-headed coneflower, retibita pinata, and then I have Black-eyed Susan, and then I have Helianthus annuus, which is the wild annual sunflower. So I'm gonna take two spots, see where this is gonna go. Closer to that edge, and this one's up on this edge. So we're gonna go far out here. This, is, this looks like a rice. It's nice to see all the different seeds. Yeah, you might wanna take some closer to that. Yeah. Such cool shapes. I know. This looks more like a... Like Black flax seeds. Yeah, like flax seeds are, I was thinking, the, the things that the... I can't even think of the, gold, the goldfinches eat. Niger seed. You got some left? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm gonna keep some left because I wanna, um, where are we gonna plant the lupine in another shape? It'd be nice to carry through with some of that theme here. I don't know what, whether this is gonna take or not when you seed like this. You just don't know. We have false aster, Boltonia asteroides, and I already know that we have this in the landscape, so that's why I didn't really order that much. Vernonia fasciculata, that's ironweed. It grows in more wet areas, so we'll probably plant that a little closer to the pond. And then this is red poppy. <laughs> I don't think this is a native, but... Oh, that's tiny. Yeah, it looks so pretty. These are just little, little splotches of red poppy. So, that's it, and then we'll finish it off. Even though you can't see it, I swear I'm seeding. <laughs> it's like fairy dust. I know. You better hope that it's the plant you want too. I always think about that. I'm like, man, they could stick in something totally different. What if it is rice? <laughs> they just throw rice in there. I know. Or sand. I'm seeing a lot of those metal pins still. Look. Really? 
God, a never ending I know. pile of trash. Look. What are you? I can't believe you just pulled two more up. I know. I saw another one over there and I didn't pull it up. It's unbelievable. You probably pulled like thousands of these out of the ground. Magic carpet. I mean, look, it's only such a small portion of what we need to do. So when are you going to do the rest? Whenever we get the rest of the seeds. Yeah, but you still have some left. I know, but I don't have, I don't have, don't have the, other the other rest ones. of the main species yet to finish those circles. So we'll see what other seven he has, and then hopefully we'll get closer to what we need to do. Ah, bit by bit. Bit by bit. Doesn't have to all happen in one day. Yeah, and it's also we might not. Progress. We might not use get to use all the seeds that we originally wanted. So we'll have to come up with some other plan. That's it. Before the winter really was upon us, we got about 40% of our seeds planted. The rest, if they become available, will be reserved for a spring planting. Most of the time, you won't see the results of your meadow until about three years out. So we'll be documenting the progress of this meadow project on the channel. So stay tuned for future videos.